but there's no set uh, format for this. Um, it's just supposed to be a panel discussion. I don't have any prearranged questions because they only asked me on Sunday if I would host it. Um, so we're just going to take questions from the audience. Um, maybe we could get somebody. Is there a session runner for this? Do we have uh, somebody who's officially representing the running the room? No, I guess not. Okay. Uh, does someone would someone run the microphone around and answer quest, uh, ask questions of people? Anybody who has questions. So, thank you, Heinek. Uh, Heinek, sorry, I'm. Somebody, I'll get your name correct. Heinek. Heinek. Okay, so we actually have uh, four people on stage, and there are a couple other people in the room. Um, we'll just ask people very quickly to introduce themselves. Uh, so hi, I'm Victor Stiner. I'm a Python code developer I'm working on Red Hat, uh, for Red Hat on uh, OpenStack. I'm Larry Hastings. I'm the release manager for Python 3.4 and 3.5. I'm working on removing the gill. That's called the galactomy. I just talked about it. Hi, I'm Christian Imus. I'm also working for Red Hat on identity management and security engineering. Uh, also for Python, mostly in the last couple of years, work on security. So. SL model, HashLab, and uh, some apps. Hi, uh, I'm Yuri Selvanov. Uh, I work on async await uh, and support and maintain async IO. Okay, so um, if you guys run out of questions, then we all have to leave. So keep asking questions, and we can stay for the whole hour, and you can enjoy the air conditioning. Okay, I hope somebody has a question, because otherwise this is going to be really boring. Ah. A hand has been raised. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for uh, being here, sharing your knowledge and experience. Um, I've used an, uh, sys set trace in the past to build. Can you hold it closer to your mouth, please. Sure. I've used sys set trace to build debuggers and other tools controlling the execution of Python code, uh, and that helps me do it on a uh, line by line basis from the source code. Uh, at some point, uh, I liked in the, to experiment doing that, something similar to that, on a opcode by opcode basis. Uh, would it be something simple to add a sys set trace, let's call it equivalent, to play around at the opcode level? Uh, do you want a debugger to execute uh, instruction per instruction? Something like that, yes. Okay, currently there is no such thing, but uh, uh, there is uh, an open issue uh, of uh, Stefan to at least de um, display the executed by code. Um, but uh, if you want something else, maybe you, uh, you have to modify CPython. What I usually do is to use GDB for that, and uh, you put a breakpoint and use a, a, a regular debugger. Yes, I discussed that with Stefan e exactly yeah. yesterday, uh, and GDB is great but then it's too far from Python source code. So my idea know, would be to be somewhere in between uh, where uh, Python bytecode is pretty much easy to match against uh, Python source code and go from there. So with GDB, you have also Python bindings for GDB where you can get more information from the actual Python object that might help you even know that. There's a Python plugin for GDB. Um, and also, Vic, um, Brad Cannon and Dino Phelan from Microsoft are working on a new feature to make the, to, the plugging system to plug in JITs into CPython. And the same hook could be used to analyze bytecode on a bytecode okay. level. That might get you their, they don't know the PEP number, but it's one of the, is the PEP already released, really? Do you know? The PEP, the, the PEP for uh, line by line, um, doing something to your code. Um, I think the PEP has been released and it has a number, but I don't remember what the number is. But uh, Brett's very good about writing PEPs, and so I'm sure it's got out there. I could look it up if you were curious. If you Thank just you. search for, um, the author would be Canon, um, and, well, just search for Canon, C-A-N-N-O-N, in the PEP index, and you'll find it. Okay, that's a great pointer. Thank you. Why does AsyncIO not support UDP in the IOCP reactor? ICP event loop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Victor Stinner panel. <laughs> UDP, uh, it works on Linux, uh, but for Windows, uh, we need someone to write the code. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it's in my to-do list since one year, but 
I'm not really passionate by uh, Windows. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a little bit more space in the question. It's about Windows and scientific users. Just a quick uh, review of this, the state right now. Um, if you use, if you want to compile Fortran extensions, it's no problem on Unix, on, on Mac, and, uh, and Linux. But on Windows, it's a problem because now the, the new compiler for Python 3.5 is due uh, to 2015, and there's no MingGW yet that supports this model. So you cannot use MingGW to, comp to compile. Uh, extensions. So you could use uh, Visual Studio Express. The problem is there's no Fortran compiler with it. So if you use G Fortran, you need GCC or MingGW to, to link it. So the problem is now if I want to release this, this uh, my package which has Fortran extensions on Windows, I can only uh, uh, deploy it on Python 3.4, which is not really long-term sustainable. So, so you're, you're talking about compiling Fortran as a C extension for C Python, and yeah. this works under 3.4, but under 3.5 you have difficulties on Windows. Yeah, it doesn't work. So uh, the thing is, I use F2Py, uh, F2Py, which helps me to generate a C extension from Fortran source code, which is something that's it's very nice. So you compile this Fortran, and for this one you need a G Fortran compiler, and the G Fortran compiler needs to link, is it works together with GCC, which is MingGW on Windows, but uh, MingGW is not released on Windows yet. So the, the compiler, you, you work pretty fast with the new Microsoft compilers, but I cannot use a Microsoft compiler, but I need to compile Fortran, and I, I, don't, I don't think they work together, so yeah. Okay, it's not to be flippant, but I didn't know that you could compile C extensions in Fortran on any platform. Like, I'm baffled that all of this is possible at all. Um, does anybody on the panel know about Fortran extensions? Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's more just that, 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 that you're aware of it. It's, it's something uh, I've been doing for more than 17 years, so the, the Fortran extension, so it's there for a long time. Okay. And a lot of science, the big, a big part of the, the SciPy stack actually is written in Fortran. Okay. So there's the Alus LPAC and LAP and all kinds of stuff, which is written in Fortran. A lot of those numerical routines of Fortran, they're wrapped. So what does NumPy do um, to distribute their extension on Windows then? They use they use they so use, com the real C compiler, they, they use the commercial real compilers. Compiler. They use the Intel commercial compilers. Okay. So you can, but you need to have a commercial compiler, and I cannot just. Uh, this is, that's a problem if if you if you so like. The, so the pain point is oh, open software developed with free tools. You can't do three five Fortran yes. extensions on Windows. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Okay. Uh, hey, you might be able to get a free license by Microsoft. So uh, Microsoft is donating for at least five or eight years uh, free version of the commercial tools for uh, open for, source developers. For Fortran compiler? Uh, everything. So I've got an MSDN ultimate license from Microsoft. Uh, you need every year that had really everything Microsoft ever offered for development at all. So Windows licenses, I'm, compilers, I'm Microsoft has Visual a Studio. Mm -hmm. If you're doing open source software, you might be able to get that too. Um, I could rely you to the guy who's doing the the open source licenses for us uh, later on. Just contact okay. me. So it's, it's not for a commercial product. It's just really for working on open source. It's open source. Releasing that as open source, you might get a license from Microsoft for free. But I don't think Microsoft has a Fortran compiler. They, gave, they, they stopped the Fortran compiler more than 10 years ago. Do, do they have one? And, and who has this compiler? Is it Intel? Intel has a Fortran compiler. Okay. and. Uh, uh, Portland, Fortran compiler cell, Fort I never use them, but Intel is a, probably the fastest Fortran compiler commercial one out there. And Intel actually needs Visual Studio, they need Visual Studio link or to link. I used Intel before, but you need to, to renew every year, you have to buy 500 bucks to, to have the license. Okay, well, um, I would say this is more of a question for the NumPy guys anyway. Like, I've, I've literally never heard of this, uh, but the NumPy guys should have some sort of answer for you. Because this is, if this is very common in the NumPy world, then hopefully they would have an answer. Yeah, they, 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 I think they, they use, they use com commercial compiler for this. Okay. Uh, because they, there is a lot, so that's fine. But if you want other people to compile things, and you want open source, uh, it's difficult to have a commercial compiler. I understand, compiler. but the, this is the wrong panel to ask, is what I'm saying, is we don't have an answer for you. Okay, I, I just want to make, me, make, make you aware that when you, when you move very quickly with there's no Microsoft compilers, then the ecosystem might not be able to follow that quickly. That's maybe just something you might have considered. Oh, right. So this, you're, the part of the, the pain point here is that we update the compiler on Windows for 3.5. Well, so the, the update to the compiler, um, 
okay, so there's a pain point around uh, 2.7. So 2.7 was released in 2010, and it's stuck on a particular version of the Microsoft compiler, which was reasonably current at the time, and it's, it's not supported anymore. Uh, Microsoft made a specific release of that for open source just for us, so that people could compile C extensions. Because in the past, what would happen is that um, C Python would be released, and it would be dependent on a particular version of Microsoft's uh, compiler tools, and when those were no longer supported, it would be very hard to compile extensions for that version of C Python. So the version that micro we shipped on with 3.5, is the first version of Microsoft's compiler where they claim that they will actually be backwards compatible with future compiler releases. So you'll be able to compile an extension for Python 3.5 with future versions of the Microsoft C compiler toolkit. So it was actually kind of an exciting feature okay. that we updated the version of the compiler for 3.5. Also in general, I think it's best practice to just be on the current version of the compiler anyway. So yes, I gather it's a pain point. Um, I had no idea about this, uh, but um, that would be, that would also be a good question for Steve Dower, who unfortunately is not here. But Steve okay. Dower is really the single guy driving uh, Windows development um, as a core developer these days. Like, he's the first name that's going to come up every time. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the Pope. Is Python the language getting less accessible for beginners um, with uh, recent releases? Um, I worry about that, yes. So, so this is interesting. Um, I used to have um, a, a blog, or excuse me, I used to have a podcast um, I haven't touched in a couple of years called Radio Free Python. And I interviewed Raymond Hedinger. And Raymond does a lot of training in C Python, in, in Python, I should say, um, where he'll go to some institution where they want to use Python and he'll train people who've never used Python before and get them up to speed. And he said that it was a big pain point for him between Python 2 and Python 3. Uh, Python 2, like the first day he could have, by the end of the day, he could be able to have people opening files and parsing them and processing them and doing all sorts of, sorts of things. Whereas in Python 3, he had to teach them about Unicode first because most people hadn't encountered that. And they had to understand that the point where you're encoding and you're turning things from bytes into strings and all that. And he's, what he said was, with Python 3, Unicode is now day zero knowledge. And so in order to program in Python 3, you really have to understand Unicode. Whereas it was a, kind of an optional thing before. Now I, see, I view that as a good thing, but it is also a, a heavier um, conceptual load for the starting Python programmer. Um, we're adding more and more syntax. I mean, it's not like to the point where we're not the D language by any stretch, but um, there are increasingly more syntaxes that are unfamiliar to you, and you say, well, what does that do? And then you have to go and read some documentation because you've never seen that construction before. I remember once um, I was positively baffled by seeing four else, and I'd never seen it before, and I was like, what does this even do? And I figured it out, and then I said, when did they add this? And then I went back and looked, and like it was in the first version of C Python. So it was very clever, but I'd never seen it before. And it, so every time that you have one of these syntactic constructions that no one's ever seen before, that's where things get a little funny. So um, what I would say is that in general, the language is not changing very much from version to version. We add very little new syntax. I think in 3.5, we added the uh, at sign for the matrix multiply operator, which literally isn't even used in C Python, like none of the types use it. Um, and I think there was maybe one other syntactic change, and I can't even put my mind on it. Async a wait, and all right, that's, that happened right at the end. And that added a whole bunch of stuff, and I don't even understand it right now. So, um, yes, I worry about it. Um, I think that, in general, the language is already so complete and so uh, old and feature rich that it's kind of hard to find new features that you want to add to it anyway. And so, and type hints. Was, uh... Type hints, yes. What about type hints? Uh, there is conceptual a lot of overload of type hints for beginners. In uh... well, um, my dodge on that is that type hinting has been there since 3.0, so it's only now that we're starting to use it, but it's actually been there for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just want to clarify about Unicode. So Raymond, I think he teaches mostly in North America, and uh, in North America it's mostly English. So for English-speaking users, maybe there is some conceptual overload about Unicode, they have, it's, an, it's a new concept for them. Maybe before they just worked in 
with latin one encoding but for the rest of the world it's actually a good change it actually simplifies a lot of stuff you don't see a lot of unicode errors you don't have to follow some specific projects guidelines like in django you have to do unicode in some specific ways in python 2 in order to avoid having unicode errors so it it, it, it does simplify a lot of things in, in python actually maybe it is a little bit harder to teach people about it, but it's an important concept to actually understand and to uh, spend less time debugging your Python code later. Uh, and about new syntax, uh, a lot of new syntax is optional, like if you don't need async await, you just don't use it. As a beginner, you don't need to know about async await at all. You just go through for loops, uh, print hello world, stuff like that. It's, 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 it's not a big issue. Uh, as for the type hints, uh, Guida uh, himself said that this is kind of an experimental provisional feature. Uh, we won't be annotating standard library yet. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, does it require some additional maybe syntax? Uh, maybe it doesn't. We'll see. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's kind of an advanced feature for uh, large software developers, for large, large projects. And again, it simplifies development a lot. Um, right, right. I guess the risk is that beginners might encounter this stuff on Stack Overflow. Um, they've not been taught it, and they, it's like, uh, this, is this even Python? Right. And the, the, at the point that we add type pending to the standard library, um, the standard library is supposed to be a place to go and read good Python source code. And so if you tell beginners, oh, go and read the Python library, then you're going to have to understand what type pending is, and at the very least, know how to ignore it properly. Um, but I, I, uh, there, uh, somebody piped up and said uh, type pending is still a bad idea. Um, I'm on the fence about it. What Guido says is that Python, excuse me, Google and Facebook both had their own independent projects to add static type pending to Python, and um, it became very obvious this was something that large um, coding houses needed. You should have some experience in that. Um, are there? Are you familiar with a, a large coding house that might take some advantage of type pending if it existed? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's not that there isn't a need for it. It's just that um, the guy off in his garage coding up something, and he's the only developer on his project. He doesn't need type hints. He doesn't need the help. But there are definitely institutions where it's going to be very helpful. So um, I really can't say no to type hinting. Uh, and I hope that the rest of you will at least learn to love it the way that uh, um, its developers love it. OK. Um, moving on, hopefully. Thank you. Well, I don't see any hands raised. Do we all get to go home early? Oh, there's a hand up. Thank you for running the microphone around, by the way, Hinek. You're very welcome. Um, so a question. How is CPython core development funded, and are you happy with the situation? CPython core development is essentially not funded. Um, there are a lot of people who contribute their spare time to it. Um, there are a handful of people who are paid to work on it full time, uh, very rare. Um, the one name that comes immediately to mind is Donald Stuffed, um, who doesn't work on CPython itself, but he's the guy who's keeping PyPI running, um, and he's also doing a lot of work in packaging. Um, are you guys aware of someone who's paid full time to work on CPython? Like, uh, or really on CPython? I know I thought you were working on OpenStack. You're not working on CPython core development. In fact, uh, <laughs> in fact uh, um, Red Hat gives me time to work on CPython, so it's part of my term, time, but uh, it, uh, it's not my job at full time. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, if I, we are happy of the situation, I'm not happy of the situation because. Uh, many huge company use Python, and I, and I expect that uh, such company have some money to to fund uh, the PSF, and I would be very happy to see more um, um, developers pay to do that. Okay, so about that, we have like every year at the PyCon US, we have the Python Language Summit. Uh, that's where all the implementers of CPython, other Python implementations, and people from um, core projects come in, join together, exchange stories, and do like exchanging ideas for the next year. And one of the ideas we had, I think even after the language summit, so kind of unofficially, 
And we should do again what we did like even before my time, before I joined C Python Core Development in 2008, have uh, maybe once a year like a kind of a meeting or, or a sprint where we get together in one location and uh, just hack on stuff and don't even doing implementation of code, but rather exchange ideas again and more on a coding level and implementation level. And we're currently looking into that. <laughs> well, um, we're actually, uh, we are having a small sprint uh, in uh, September, uh, going to be held in California, and it was invite only, it's very small. Um, and that's sponsored, um, so uh, like hotels are being paid for and things. Uh, but in general, most people who are uh, doing Python core development are, are donating their own time to it. Guido very famously got to uh, pick his own projects when he worked at Google, and I think it's kind of true when he's at Dropbox as well, but he prefers to spend about 50% doing Python development and 50% doing like real projects for the company that he's working for. He, he says it sort of helps him stay grounded. Um, most people don't have that luxury. Most people are not Guido von Rossum. And yeah, it is sort of surprising that so few people are paying for Python core development to progress and so many people are interested in it. You know, it's the story of the little red hen. Uh, but I don't know how to change the situation particularly. Um, the PSF um, has a pretty decent sized war chest. Um, it's got a couple of million bucks, I guess. And it hasn't been spending the money very much for specifically on Python core development. It's been spending its money, you know, running PyCon and then sponsoring like sprints and meetups. Um, but not core development for the most part. So um, there is kind of an idea to try and nudge the PSF back into putting a little bit more money into core development stuff. Yeah, I think that's all we got. <laughs> oh, another hand. Could you share with us uh, what's the future of Python in terms of uh, features, in terms of where are we going, or what are the ideas that you share between you, and where mm. are we? Yeah. Well, we're removing the gill. Um, <laughs> beyond that, I really have no idea. Well, so the, 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 the general answer to this question is, we're, what are, the future of CPython is whatever people add to CPython. And this is not, again, being flippant. Um, maybe long ago, there was a master plan for CPython that Guido had in his head. He was like, I want to add this, and I want to add that, and I want to add that. It's been 25 years. Guido's added all the stuff that he wanted to add. So um, there are people who have ideas about how to enhance CPython, and we have this whole PEP process. And so if you want to see the, the immediate future of CPython, like the near-term future, running out maybe a year or two, I would say read the PEPs that are open. Uh, beyond that, nobody has any idea. I mean, the individual developers have ideas of things they want to add to CPython. I have ideas for things I want to do, not necessarily visible to the user, but like internal implementation details. Like, things like the galactomy, but there are other things as well. Not really user visible, though. But uh, fundamentally, Python is changed by the core developers, and the core developers are the ones who propose the changes and make the changes. They're the ones who are steering it. So we could individually answer what we're interested in working on and what we're hoping to do in the future. <laughs> But there's no grand master plan, no. Uh, yeah, as Larry said, most of the new features are proposed by core developers. But actually, any one of you can suggest new features. Uh, first of all, you should Google, if it was suggested before, you should Google Python ideas, uh, mailing list, archives. Uh, maybe it was proposed before, then you should read and see why this idea was rejected. Uh, usually, there is a very good reason for it. Uh, if it wasn't ever proposed, then you can um, tell us about your idea on Python ideas, and if uh, core developers find uh, that they can actually implement it, uh, it will be implemented. Uh, maybe we'll need to champion a PEP, uh, Python and Catsman proposal, uh, but that's a pretty standard uh, thing to do. Uh, there are guidelines how to do it, there are lots of PEPs to read through. So I'd say if you have an exciting idea, just go and propose it on Python Ideas. Uh, now, as Larry said, there is no uh, global agenda for Python to what direction it should move. Each core developer uh, has uh, uh, their own plan. 
about that, I can tell you about mine. Uh, what I actually want to do in Python uh, 3.6, uh, if I have time, I want to add asynchronous uh, generators to make Python even harder to learn. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that's a very exciting new feature, I think, but uh, there are lots and lots of technical details on how they will work and uh, how they might not work. Uh, so we still have uh, to figure out that. But I, I hope to have a pep for that uh, maybe in a month. Uh, uh, another thing that we are kind of focusing right now in for 3.6 is performance. So for instance, uh, a huge patch uh, was merged uh, about a month ago um, that optimizes how opcodes are encoded uh, and processed by the C eval loop, uh, which boosts performance uh, anywhere from zero to 15%. Uh, um, so it's quite important. I also have a couple of patches uh, that touch C eval loop and opcode processing, and they can actually boost performance from, uh, again, zero to 18 to 20%. Uh, but it's, those patches are kind of huge, and I, and I have to spend a lot of time to actually make sure that they are correct and that they don't impact performance uh, in a negative way. And this is what Victor is actually working right now. He is redesigning the Python benchmark suite. Uh, adding more benchmarks and uh, making sure that the benchmarks launcher collects more stats and does it in a correct way to actually ensure that new changes in CPython um, don't harm performance. Uh, so yeah, uh, a lot of things are happening. If you want to read about them, uh, you can subscribe to Python Dev and just listen. Uh, read, read the emails, and then you will have pretty good idea what's 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 actually going on in Python. Oh yeah. Domain. Thank you. He wants to talk about opcodes. Okay. Uh, for me, the future of C Python is to make sure that no uh, nothing changes because I like the language and I don't want to see new keywords and don't want to see new things. Oh, uh, for, for me, uh, the language is perfect. Uh, but if you say the Python, in fact, Python is much wider than just the interpreter. For me, Python is a wide community. Uh, for example, if you take the Django project, Django is not part of the C Python, but it's a very important project for Python, and I hope that many your new project will pop up in a few years and uh, will will um, help people to migrate to Py to Python and uh, make new amazing stuff. So in, uh, today, uh, PIP is working very well, much, uh, much more better than a few years ago. So we don't have to add new stuff to the C Python. I prefer to experiment and add new things outside Python and uh, publish uh, them uh, on PyPy. Um, just as a quick note, um, there's an immediate change in Python 3.6 that, um, oh no, you've already seen it, um, uh, that's called F strings. Um, I think, that, was there a lightning talk about it, like last night? Yeah, yeah okay, so you guys thought about uh, F-strings. Uh, it's, my, I think everybody's reaction is about the same. Uh, the first 10 minutes, you're like, oh, that's terrible. And then you're like, actually, that's kind of cool. So uh, hopefully you will enjoy that. Okay. Yeah, so I have a more general comment about adding new features to Python. So these days, we're all about agile processes and fast release cycles. In fact, C Python development is more like developing huge enterprise software. We have very long release cycles, so we release a new version of Python every one and a half year. We usually maintain Python for at least five or six years, even longer, and we need at least one version of Python to deprecate a new feature. So if you're planning to add a new feature now to Python, expect it to maintain the feature for at least the next six, eight, maybe 10 years. So it's a, uh, um, if you join, we welcome anybody to join CPython Core Development. We need you, we need even more people. We have a crazy amount of patches and bugs on the bug tracker. But if you join CPython, you also a bit of warning, it takes long to get a feature into Python because we don't want to add feature creep. We want to add a less features as required to get something working. Very good example was Python 2.6 uh, when we added the JSON model was usual, uh, before that a simple JSON standalone package, 
and Jason Noller and me spent a very, very long time on getting JSON model even working properly and fixing really bad regressions and we got the original author landed the package and then decided to work on his own fork most of the time. And so the simple JSON model still exists. It's not the same as the JSON model in the center library. And we just want to why that we um, have to maintain a package that gets kind of like abandoned, thrown in the center library and then abandoned. Um, speaking of the, the speed of development, by the way, one change that is happening in CPython core development right now is that we are planning a switch from Mercurial to Git. And specifically, it's not that we're moving to Git, it's that we're moving to GitHub, and that requires us to move to Git. Uh, but um, there's a lot about the CPython core development process that is kind of slow and backwards and ancient. Uh, processes that were designed back in the CVS and subversion days. So there's kind of an expectation that things will pick up a little bit uh, once we switch to Git. Um, it's going to make our workflow a lot smoother um, and it'll be easy to do things like pull requests. Um, I don't expect that that's going to speed up the pace of the change of the language uh, much, but hopefully it's going to make uh, merging bug fixes a lot quicker. Okay, I think we've answered that question in about as many ways as anybody should. Uh, do we have any other questions, please? Oh, yes, there's a hand held up. Wait. Oh, well, um, no, wrong direction, Hinek. Yeah, that fell in the... Yeah, I don't give the mic to At about Harry. nine o'clock, if you looked at the... Uh, I was actually wondering about uh, st uh, static type checking. Uh, there is MyPy, which is under development, and I know it's not really into the core, but is there any plan to include that kind of features into the Python? Okay, so um, <clears throat> as I understand it, uh, no, there are no immediate plans to add the static type checker into CPython. The plan is to have a standard for how you express types in CPython. That's the typing module. That's shipping in 3.6. Um, but the static type checkers are going to be written independently. That's my pie. And there is another one. I don't remember the, what it's called, type check, pi type? Pi type, okay. Yeah, so there are competing uh, independent type checkers. Uh, my pie is the one that Guido is working on, but I think he also contributes to pi type now and then too. Um, and the idea, again, the original idea with um, static type information was we will add the syntax to the language and then let people experiment with it and let a thousand flowers bloom. And almost nothing happened with it, and so Guido said, okay, we're going to define one, we're going to pick one, and that's going to be the official one, and now we're going to allow people to write their own static type checker so that people can enforce the level that they're comfortable with and we can experiment with it and see what the best approach is. So um, right now, there are no plans to ship a static type checker with Python, but there are plans to have a standard for how you express the type information in Python. And then eventually, I think, uh, my guess is that within a version or two, um, the standard library is going to have required uh, type information. Although Guido has said, no, that's, we're going to be a lot lazier about that. But certainly new modules that would be added to the standard library would have uh, type information probably in 3.7 is my guess. Yeah, and the next question would be uh, optimizations uh, based on those type checkings. <laughs> no, um, Guido has said in so many words that he doesn't expect the static type information to be used for optimization. Um, yeah, I, I'm just kind of not seeing it. Um, uh, we have, of course, an expert in optimizing Python, and uh, he is, you, Armin has said in so many words that uh, you don't need static type information. And in fact, static inf type information would be useless um, in its current form to PyPy because it is not nearly complete enough. They need so much more information than static type information as it's defined in Python can express that it, you might as well not bo even bother. So um, I'm not, there are, there are certainly no plans for adding optimizations based on static type information in CPython. No, no plans. I'm not aware of anybody who's interested in working on it. So even Stefan Bainel from the, C uh, from the Cython project uh, is not using any kind of the information to generate like bindings to C code. And actually, 
when you asked the question, I saw a lot of faces smiling over there, and maybe I might want to maybe come up and talk shortly about your opinion, your experience with optimizations. No, oh, he's shaking his head. So, either if you want to come up, then stand up, and if you don't want to come up, then keep sitting down. It's fine. I already said what he was going to say. Okay, fair enough. Uh, just to detail uh, what uh, Larry said, is that uh, in a JIT compiler, you don't need uh, the, um, the only, you don't have to know only that it's an, an integer. You have to know if it's always positive. You have to know the maximum value to, to use the most efficient uh, C type, depending on the range of the value. And uh, that's just an example, but uh, in a JIT compiler, you need very precise and uh, type information, much more than just uh, the high level type. Ah, uh, two hands down here. So while I am walking the longest possible distance, yes. um, I would like to uh, abuse my power as the bearer of the microphone. Um, I have kind of promised to Yuri to come back to core development in Portland and help him out with icing IO. And I'd be interested, can either of you uh, give me a, like a timeline or the current state of the infrastructure work that Brett Cannon, who sadly is not here, is doing currently? Or I can give you a quick update, yeah. So cool. again, the plan is to get on GitHub. Uh, currently, the PEP um, uh, repository has been converted to GitHub. And uh, more recently, the Dev in a Box uh, repository has been converted. I don't know what Dev in a Box is. Uh, the PEP repository is just static text files. That was pretty easy. But there, are, there there's absolutely work happening. Uh, there's a more of a grand, like, you know, we, there's a certain amount of workflow redoing, retooling that's going to happen around CPython. CPython is going to be the last thing that changes over to GitHub. Um, there are a lot of other repositories that are going to change first. And there's a lot of arguments about how the workflow should work and how we're going to use, you know, like named branches and yada, 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 yada. So, um, Absolutely, it's happening. Um, there is a mailing list, of course, that's specific for it. And it's probably one of these things where if you post to the wrong list, everyone will yell at you and they'll tell you to go and post to this other list instead. Uh, but there is a core, develop, core workflow mailing list and it is very active. Um, I don't remember, I, I dimly remember there was something about we'd really like to get CPython on GitHub by the end of the year. I'm not saying that that's absolutely what they said. I may be completely misremembering, but that's maybe. Did uh -huh. they say which year? I'm sorry? <laughs> Did they say which year? Yeah, no, they didn't say which year, of course not. It's probably smarter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you, you. You mentioned F strings and going through a little mental process of sort of initially being appalled and then kind of gradual acceptance, sort of maybe a five stages, but... Um, it's uh, the stages of grief. Yeah, yes. exactly. So I wonder if you could take us through that, because I think, I think I haven't got past the appalled stage, but I, I'm, I'm <laughs> absolutely open to, to move. I mean, I'm, I want to move on to the next stage, so I wonder if you could take me through the thinking there. Um, well, it's, it's simply that um, it's just going to save some time. How often do you want to insert a local variable formatted into the middle of another string? And the answer is pretty often. Wouldn't it be nice if the language could just sort of paved the way for that so that there would be a special syntax where that would happen for you automatically. And the answer is, well, yes, I could get kind of behind that. So um, fundamentally, I, I think f-strings are just going to save me some typing. Right now, I have to do something horrible, horrible, like uh, dot format uh, underscore map parenthesis locals parentheses. Star star locals will work. But, um, star star locals into format or format map and just locals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, okay, so, but you also said, ooh, at first I was a little bit appalled. So I was a bit appalled because I thought, wow, I could put sys.exit in there. And, and that, that can't be good news. I'm not um, sure. So it's, it's for local variables. I'm not sure that it pulls out um, modules. Uh, I, it's, it's uncertain to me. Do you guys remember? Like, it's like it supports uh, module variables but not built-ins or something like that? I think you can actually use any expression uh, in f string. So that's, that's why it actually will save a lot of space and a lot of code to type. And also, a lot of modern languages have this feature, and users are kind of requesting and are kind of expecting from Python to, to have this feature as well. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's a well-planned and well-discussed way of adding something like that in, in, in Python. To your reaction about sys.exit, you realize that you're the one writing the string. 
So if you write f quote marks curly brace sys dot exit uh, open parenthesis close parenthesis close curly quote close quote and you run your program and it exits and you're shocked <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with you. Um, if you're worried about this string coming in from users realize that this is a special string inside of Python it's a it's a static string inside of C Python. Um, you would have to go through some contortions in order to get a string from the user that could possibly be tainted with these curly braces sys.exit and have it auto automatically run. So I wouldn't worry about that. Okay, Andre was next. I he's been holding yeah. up his hand for a while. Um I'm wondering uh, how hard would it be to change the C Python interpreter in order to run several C Python interpreters in the same process? Ah, multiple interpreters simultaneously. So um, I have two answers for you. The first is that Eric Snow looked into doing this um, for a while and he has uh, stopped. So he found it too difficult or something like that. I think fundamentally, someone was just talking to me about it, was that uh, Yuri? Okay, maybe you could talk about it for a minute. Um, but my other, you could talk about Eric's work. My answer is that I don't think it's actually that hard. Um, so inside of C Python, there are two separate structures. There's already a Py thread state, which represents all the state that's specific to a thread. And there's another one called Py interpreter state, which is all the state that's relevant to a, a Python interpreter. Um, there are a couple of other random global variables and static variables and things sprinkled through the source code, and we'll just take a pass of cleaning those up. And then there is a single global variable that stores the current global state uh, interpreter, the global interpreter state. And we would just need to tell people to stop using that and instead use a macro that pulled it out of thread local storage or something. Um, other languages just have a context variable that, are, that you're forced to pass into every function you call and we wouldn't get away with adding one of those. So we just have to hide the reference to the current running interpreter inside of the thread state or the thread, lo uh, thread local storage or something. But I don't think it's going to be that hard. So um, as part of my galectomy work, I'm thinking that I may actually, like as a sort of a stretch goal, hope to try and get multiple interpreters running. I think that multiple threads is a lot more exciting, um, but I think multiple interpreters will solve problems for some people as well. Um, and so I'm kind of hoping that we could do it. Yeah, so as Larry said, to, to, to modify C Python, to actually figure, uh, uh, right now, you can actually have multiple interpreters running. And for instance, uh, there, is, there is an extension for Apache, it's called ModWizGi. And ModWizGi currently uh, uses multiple interpreters feature. Uh, there is some ugly code in there, it, it breaks all the time, but it actually, it actually does it. And a lot of people use that in production. So it is possible, but it's not recommended. Um, and they can kind of get away with it because they, they, the only extensions they use, they, they kind of control, they, they know what they're doing. So uh, that's why it po it's possible. Uh, to, to fix CPython uh, completely, to make it a feature, there are two issues. First is to fix all the CPython extensions that we have uh, out there, which is a very hard thing to do. Uh, and the second issue is that if you just enable um, multiple interpreters, you probably won't gain much. You can just use sub-processes, uh, multi-process uh, for that, because to actually use it efficiently, you need an efficient way of exchanging data between multiple interpreters, and, and this is really hard. This, this is an unsolved problem. Uh, it, it probably could be easier to exchange, let's say, bytes objects between sub-interpreters, but if you want to exchange uh, complex uh, data structures, uh, it's a very hard problem to solve. Um. The other thing I'd say, by the way, is that um, there's a guy, uh, James, I forgot his last name, the James Powell? Is it the, the PyGotham guy? You remember, didn't you guys know who I'm talking about? Yeah, um, so he has this cute thing he can do. Um, there's a, a couple of flags you can specify, specify to DL open that'll cause it to load an interpreter, uh, uh, load a, a shared library in a completely private way where the symbols aren't shared. And you just have, you have to pull symbols out of it using the handle that it gives you. And so you can actually load multiple um, instances of the Python shared library and have multiple, they'll each have their own gil and they'll each have their own interpreter and you can run multiple ones simultaneously. I think it only works on Linux and one or two other platforms because it's not standard uh, flags to DL open. But it does work after a fashion. He's like demonstrated in lightning talks and said, look at this crazy thing I can do. Thank you. Okay. 
so just going back to format strings, everyone's favorite topic. Um, so to me, the reason why I see format strings as sort of why I can't get past that disgusting phase is that it sort of seems a little bit incongruent with the rest of Python and not to be too prescriptivist, but the like the whole Zen of Python thing that it's adding a little bit more implicity than um, than maybe you know should exist, like combining both what the, is in the format string is to what the local variable is called. Um, is do you think that's much of a big deal, or is in, in is as far as it's doing things a little bit more magically rather than passing in dot format? Is is that just is thing explicit that's is better than implicit? Yeah. So. I have two answers for you. Um, the first is um, Raymond Hettinger has a, a sort of a mantra that he tells people that I very much agree with. Uh, Gu Python is Guido's language, he just lets us use it. <laughs> and uh, Guido likes format strings and therefore they're going in the language and Guido's letting us use the language he calls Python and we should get to use the format strings too. The other thing I would say is that if you think that format strings are gonna be too magical, um, Take a look at how super works, where you don't have to pass in the object anymore. Um, there's a lot of really silly um, stuff going on there, and I would say don't read it on a full stomach. Um, so there's already a certain amount of magical stuff happening under the covers in Python, and uh, at the end of the day, I think format strings are gonna make people more productive, because it's one of these things where now you're not gonna have all this boilerplate where you're saying, dot format parentheses locals and parentheses da 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 da, which A is ugly also, and B is stuff that people are gonna get tired of looking at. It's like there's gonna be less code there, and it's gonna be very clear what's going on, and the implementation details may be a little yucky, but that's what Python is. Python is the language where we take the hit, we do all the hard work and all of the really nasty work under the covers, and we give you this wonderful language that's very pleasant to use and you have to write less code and you can get your problem solved more quickly and you have less code to read and it's easy to read and understand. So again, at the end of the day, I really think that format strings are a win. I'm looking forward to 3.6. Sure. Other people, sure. Let's talk about format strings. This is the format <laughs> strings panel. So I mentioned that I don't like super. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Maybe that's sure. Totally You're a little late. Mm -hmm. So more generally, uh, as I said, I'm opposed to any change in Python, and uh, when a new pep comes in, I try to fight to avoid any change. <laughs> but Guido has the superpower to accept anything, so at the end, I have to, I have to accept that it's in. And uh, I started to use fstring and the, also the new unpack generaliz generalization, uh, which is also a um, tiny change, but uh, if you accumulate all these new features of Python 3 and uh, you use them without having to think too, too far, in fact, it's really much more efficient than before because the code looks more obvious, the code looks uh, simple. And um, another answer from uh, Guido, when I was uh, strongly opposed to any kind of change, because, for example, you can call uh, exit in the middle of a C string or you can import module or do strange things, is that uh, the Python language must not uh, restrict the user. In fact, uh, it's a language, you are free to use it as you want. You can write very crappy code, but it's up to you. And uh, if you would like to uh, validate, the quick, check the quality of the code, you have linters like PyLint, PyChecker, PyFlex, and things like that, which helps you to detect uh, stinky code. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to add quickly, uh, when this feature was discussed, the f-strings, uh, when they were discussed on uh, Python dev mailing list, a lot of people were asking like why we are adding force uh, way of, of for formatting strings. And I liked what Guido said. He said that 10 years down the road, nobody will use other three methods. Everybody will be using f-strings because they are convenient. So when you think about new features in, in, in Python when we add them, just think about big picture, what will happen in 10 years? Are we done? Does anybody else have questions about f-strings, as long as we're on the subject? It's a nice group therapy. We should have sampled the stage of grief before and after. Um, I have one question about f-strings. Um, <laughs> shouldn't they be 
shouldn't it be possible to make them faster than uh, like f the format call? I think they are a little faster. Eric Smith was the guy implementing them, and he was um, he was like, I am going to keep going on this. I'm going to keep working on this until this is the fastest way that you can do string interpolation. And I'm so it's like, I, literally, I think that there's like bytecode, uh, there's special, uh, I don't know if it's bytecode support for it or if he's like uh, using existing bytecodes, but it was like, no, this is faster than everything else. Yeah, that's what I assumed. I'm sure there has been a lot of uh, grief progressions right now. Uh, I think Paul was the next. This is not about format strings. This, oh, is, well, about, this uh, is about bad ideas. Um, it's a, Christian's point about simple JSON made me think of this as a process kind of question. Think back two years, 10 years, whatever time scale you want. Think of a bad decision. Uh, something that everyone on the core team thinks in hindsight was the wrong feature, change, design, whatever. Uh, and give a little post-mortem on what went wrong. Was there a process-related flaw in decision-making that led to that? Is there anything you can learn from past mistakes? Oh, I got one. Uh, and I had a little discussion about this with Guido at uh, PyCon, actually. Um, in Python 3.0, uh, when you index into a byte string, you get an integer back. And I really think that it should give you back another byte string, kind of like indexing into strings gives you strings. Byte, indexing into byte strings gives you byte strings. And what happened there was um, the original idea for how byte strings were going to work in CPython was one way, and then over the course of about 18 months, it kind of changed and kept changing and kept changing and sort of cycled around to where byte strings really kind of behaved like strings again. Um, and nobody realized that when you index into them, you should get byte strings back again. That would really be convenient. And then Python 3 shipped, and we really couldn't change it anymore. Um, I suggested to Guido that, so, okay. Um, at PyCon, twice, Guido walked up to me, and he said, you know, Larry, if you get this galectomy thing to work, maybe we'll uh, merge it into CPython, and we'll call that CPython 4.0. And I said, well, if we change it, if we call it port Python 4.0, then maybe we can make breaking changes. And I've got a breaking change. And he said, you know, what is it? Everyone's got their one thing. And I said, indexing into byte strings should give you back a byte string. He said, oh, that's pretty good. Maybe we could do that in Python 3. And so it would be like a from future import and over a couple of versions and da 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 da, da. I'm still kind of, it makes me a little anxious where he was talking about changing something like that in the 3 series. But who knows, maybe we could change it. But anyway, fundamentally, I, I, it's hard to say that there, there's a process change here. Um, I worry too much about like when something bad happens that people say, oh, we need to install a new process and prevent them from ever happening again. I think it's better to stay lightweight and just sort of handle problems as they come up. So I wouldn't try and add a new process around preventing this sort of thing. And fundamentally, again, um, this is sort of a language design thing, and the way that language design works is that you get Guido to say yes or no, and there's nothing I would want to change about that process. Uh, the, the development of Python is very, very open. Anyone is free to join the mailing list. Uh, we have the Python IDs mailing list to, to discuss new IDs. And there is a Python dev mailing list to discuss more concrete IDs, which are more mature. And in my opinion, there, there are too many discussions because uh, too many people give their opinion. And it's, it's, sometimes it's very, really difficult to read all messages, like thousands and thousands of messages. So I, um, from my point of view, we have enough uh, people to, to check that the future will work on in any case and we will catch most uh, issues very early in the design of new features. And uh, if I would like to find one mistake in Python from last year, uh, for me it would be the migration from Python 2 for, to Python 3. Python 3, it's a great language, it's very, very nice. It's just a migration which was not really well prepared. If I have to do that new, once again, I would uh, help people to migrate more slowly, step by step. Yeah, about the migration from 2 to 3, uh, I think our time machine was totally broken and we got in the wrong universe. So. I joined uh, the Python core development team right about when we are working on Py3K, uh, the development name of Python 3.0 and 2.6, and we all had this grand idea 
that people would write Python 2 code. We had one tool that was able to migrate the code to Python 3, and it didn't even occur to us that um, there's a possibility to write code that works on both versions of Python. So, um, in retrospective, at one point I had even the idea it should be a bit easier to, uh, for the migration, and I added during the development of Python 2.6 the B prefix and the alias that str equals bytes for Python 2.6. Uh, but for me, it was just the idea to give uh, the 2 to 6 program, uh, 2 to 3 program, like an indicator. Yeah, that's really a byte string, and um, every single prefix with you is a Unicode string. And if you find something that's not prefixed with either uh, B or U, warn the user that the user has to make a decision about that kind of string. Um, yeah. So later on, we came, we were, we were made aware that it's actually possible to write code that works on both versions. Uh, later on, we re added features like the U prefix again to Python 3 just to make it easier to uh, write polyglot code. But yeah, that's one of the, I think, the biggest mistake we, as the core development team, did. We totally didn't expect the way that the migration is going to work. I think all of our mistakes were around the conversion to 3.0. So there you go. And the 3.0, it, it's, it's hard pressed. I would not say that 3.0 was a mistake, uh, but it's certainly been a, a, a tough uh, process to get everybody up to 3. More hands? Oh, come on. Doesn't somebody else want to complain about F-strings? Okay, we've got some more hands. Um, would it be possible for Python to detect circular imports? I, I think Python already um, handles circular imports to a certain extent. If you if, you, if A imports B and B imports C and C imports A, then something happens. It, it notices. I don't remember yeah. what it does. Sometimes it even works. Uh, so the import system uh, creates first like a model object and then fills the model object with attributes during the import. And okay, I'm not really sure that it's still true with the new import system Brett Cannon wrote, but unless you actually um, access any attributes on the circular way, you can still import them and then later on access them. So that mostly works. But uh, if you happen to use circular import attributes in the globals of the model, then it breaks. So if you carefully craft your code in a way that first uh, imports all your models and then you actually execute code later on after you have done all the imports, then you're safe. Um, that's one of the issues I solved, tried to solve a, a long while ago is people did some funky things like during the import of the model they spawned a new thread and the thread executed new code and the code has like embedded import statements inside the code we used functions like the uh, string formatting up, uh, method on date times, which did an internal import, and that could cause deadlocks. So don't mix threading and imports, and try, if you do circular imports, try to defer any kind of code execution after you have fully imported your, your program. That's good practice. Yeah, so the two rules are don't use recursive imports and don't use recursive imports. There is always, it's, it's always possible to actually restructure your module, mo modules uh, in a way that they uh, don't require this. Uh, Python, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, uh, you will see an import, in, an import error, which is kind of hard to decipher sometimes. Brett Cannon, uh, he is like the lead devel developer behind ImportLib. He knows about this issue. This is not an easy issue to solve, to give you a nice, uh, um, nice error message uh, 
telling you precisely what's going on, what kind of cycle was detected. So uh, he knows about this issue. Maybe uh, he will come up uh, with an idea how to fix it. Or if you have, have an idea about that, you can, you can approach him, I guess. I'd say also it falls a little bit under the um, uh, consenting adults rule. In Python, we have a couple of guidelines that aren't necessarily in the Zen of Python. One of them is called consenting adults, which is just the idea that Python programmers are adults and we shouldn't chide them too much. If they try to do something that's a little naughty, like let them go ahead and do the naughty thing. So yeah, if you're gonna have circular imports and it's important to you and you can get it to work, knock yourself out. And if it doesn't work, then it's kind of on you. So that's the sort of uh, consenting adults rule applied here, okay? Moving on. Do you want a string question for a meanwhile? <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's maybe nothing to nothing profound here, but I'm curious about how the galectomy will afford, um, affect threading and multiprocessing. Is that is that just going to be a really straightforward transition that all of those interfaces will just work as expected, such okay. that when you spawn new threads that you'll, the people you'll th th Just to, to uh, interrupt you a little bit, the people are flooding in because we're out of time, so uh, this is going to be the last question. Uh, but your question is, is the galactomy going to affect C APIs, um, or is it going to affect C, uh, Python code? Yeah, I was thinking more about the, pi the higher level threading and multiprocessing Interfaces. Okay, so the answer there is that Python today supports multi-threaded code. And on uh, Iron Python and Jython, you can write multi-threaded code that actually runs on multiple cores simultaneously. You can do that today. And it's Python, and it's supported by the standard library. So no, none of those interfaces have to change. It's just that now, instead of running on a single core, like if you write a program and it runs on Jython and Iron Python on multiple cores, C Python today, it runs on a single core. In the future, it might run on multiple cores. So you already have to write thread-safe code and use locks and those sorts of things. And in the future, it'll just run multi-core. So no, the interfaces aren't going to change. Okay, all right, we're out of time. We gotta get off the stage. Thank you for asking questions and making us look like we had something to do. Um, this is the end of the panel. Bye.